One of the theories that sort of underpins the submission is that uh, DeRay Bentley Richards was a victim of tunnel vision. Yes. Maybe you can describe what that means. The, t the concept of tunnel vision is really that um, at an early step, an early stage of an investigation, instead of having a very open-minded approach to the evidence and a genuine inquiry as to what is the truth, what are the facts, what can we learn about this, uh, and exploring all different possible avenues, at a very early stage in this investigation, the police formed a conclusion, Richards is the obvious and really the only suspect. And they then investigated the case in a way that was aimed to build up an overwhelming case against him and to incriminate him. We have letters, uh, rather startling letters from, Crown from a Crown prosecutor on this case where he's not simply asking a lab for an opinion about evidence, but rather saying, here's our theory of the case. We need to put that car at this location. We need to put these people together. We need to put this guy in jail is the effect of those letters. Hmm. Um, and so we say this is a case that had uh, classic tunnel vision. Now that doesn't mean, and it, we've never argued that the police deliberately set out to frame someone or maliciously uh, went after uh, Richards. In all likelihood, my own theory is the police very genuinely probably were persuaded and convinced they had the right person. But as a result of that, what it meant is, instead of looking at a piece of evidence and saying, well, where does this take us? What, where, what directions does it point to? Everything was put through a prism of saying, how can we take that and put it on the scales against Richards? How can we use it against him? And one of the really startling examples of tunnel vision, to me this is just absolutely shocking. This was uh, quite a sexualized murder. It was a 21-year-old young woman. Her body was found uh, naked by the roadside in a sexual position. And, uh, and when her body was examined uh, by the police and by the pathologist, a number of hairs were found on her body, a total of 183 hairs collected from her body. Those hairs were taken and preserved and sent for sampling and testing. So this is well before the CSI series, but it's that sort of a process where they're doing the work you'd expect to say whose hair is on the naked body of the sexualized killing victim. That just seems like the most obvious type of inquiry. Of course, if Richards, if a hair of Richards had been on her body, and his account is, I did not see her, I had I'd met her once briefly months before and that's it, that would be overwhelming and damning proof that he was the murderer. But amazingly enough, there was testing done. The testing established none of the hairs matched Jury Richards. And then rather than continuing to say, well, can we learn anything? Can we learn anything about these hairs? Do they belong to the deceased? Or do they belong to someone else? Um, because that's likely to be the culprit. And amazingly enough, once they determined it wasn't Richard's hair, that was the end of any testing. They simply closed down that line of inquiry. What, why can't they simply test that, those hairs now? Well, that's a deeply disturbing part of this case. That evidence is gone. Even though Jury Richard sits in a federal jail to this day, that evidence is gone. The police destroyed it uh, in, I think, around 2002-2003 early in the 2000s is the period of time where that evidence was burned at a sawmill. Um, the police explanation has been that that was part of routine evidence destruction. But we, in the application, identify that as a gravely unfair thing. And of course, between the time of this murder in 1992 and today, there have been absolute leaps and bounds in DNA evidence. So had someone done nothing more than say, let's hold on to those hairs, let's put them in a Ziploc bag in an envelope and say, do not destroy until this man's out of jail. If they'd done that, they would have an ability now to test uh, that hair and perhaps get DNA to identify the real killer. Hmm. It seems strange that uh, evidence would be burned as part of routine document destruction. Um, is that the typical way to do things? Well, it is strange, and, and for us it's very worrying. Our understanding is that the RCMP, and this was an RCMP investigation, that the RCMP have changed their policies and practices since the time of that occurring. Um, 
We don't have a basis to say that it was done maliciously here to avoid any prospect of Richard's undoing his conviction or challenging it. But the point of the fact of it is for him right now, he's in a horribly invidious position where, you know, conceptually, uh, one envelope held in a file uh, would open the door to testing that could exonerate him and could identify the real killer. For the victim's family, this is uh, equally uh, potentially of great concern that someone who didn't commit the murder has been free all of these years and having a chuckle over the fact that someone else is sitting uh, in the pen. Now, I understand that that was not the only evidence that um, was destroyed or, or, or perhaps lost over the years. There was, uh, I mean, there was even the car, the, this, this massive Ford. Should police hold on to all of the evidence that they gather yeah. in perpetuity, or what do you think should that? Happen is that is a difficult question, and so uh, I think being realistic about the world, um, uh, there's any number of cases where the police go in with a search warrant in search of residence. The Picton property is an example of a really extensive detailed search that led to evidence in a murder case, a multi-murder case. Uh, and of course, that hasn't been land that's been preserved. Houses that are searched aren't preserved. I get it that the vehicle, they can't have an impound lot forever and ever, amen, for every car that's involved in a crime. Um, so I think my own, this is really my take on your question, my own view is there's a practical side to that. If you're talking about something with an enormous uh, storage problem to it uh, that's not necessary to a case that's run its way through the system, uh, I don't disagree that those matters don't, those kinds of things don't need to be held. But our view is, especially uh, when you've got someone who's still sitting in jail for the crime, and we have very luckily in this country, a low incidence of wrongful convictions. We also know that, unfortunately, in rare cases, they do occur. There are situations where years later, we realize someone's been sitting in jail who didn't commit the crime. And when we're talking in the case of the hair samples or hair and fiber evidence or what have you, uh, really materials that could fit uh, in my coat pocket, a tiny this isn't storing a, a great old Ford Grand Torino for decades and decades. It's really as simple as one envelope that could sit somewhere undisturbed with a note and ought to destroy it. Why did the police and, and Crown get tunnel vision in this case? Why did they look at Richards as being the one who did it? Uh, my own, my, my view of it is this. Um, you know, when the police form an early conclusion that they have identified the suspect and start to build a case with tunnel vision. And again, that's, a, that's not commonplace. It's not the way the police ordinarily do the work. And most of the time, they're very careful to be open-minded in their investigations. But where they form tunnel vision, there's often a number of things that feed into it. And one of them is, and it shouldn't be surprising, it's unlikely to be the upstanding community citizen who's a member of the church choir who's profiled by the police. It's likely to be someone who has some unsavory background or has a criminal record. Richards was a, a young man at the time who had uh, somewhat of an unsavory background. He had a prior conviction uh, for violence against a woman, an assault uh, in Alberta. He was Strangely enough, although he had relocated to Creston, B.C. in the fall of 1992, and the murder happens in early December, at that point in time he was serving a weekend's, uh, sort of intermittent weekend sentence at the Creston RCMP uh, jail detachment. So that set the stage where um, he had been known to the local police as the guy from Alberta who was serving that jail sentence in that case for an offensive uh, threatening a woman in Calgary. So when Carrie Marshall went missing, which was third uh, overnight from the 3rd to the 4th of December 1992, um, the police immediately identified Richards as the potential uh, culprit in that. And, and amazingly enough, he was effectively a murder suspect before her body was even found. They actually interrogated him uh, before uh, her body had even been located when it was simply a missing persons case. Okay, if Richards, if Richards didn't kill Carrie Marshall, who did? I wish I could answer that. I wish I could, I, I wish we were in a position to say we have positive proof over here to point us to the answer to that question. Um, we simply don't have an answer for that. 
um, our argument to the minister is there's so many flaws and so many difficulties that this is an unsafe conviction. Richards has always professed his innocence, even to his own harm or his own peril, and uh, he should not be held in jail. This is a wrongful conviction. But we don't, I'm not able to supplement that by saying, in addition to that, here's the evidence to establish who really did it. We just don't know.